You know, you have such a beautiful Rav, and he says such beautiful things, and this is when it's hard for him to talk, and he's not feeling well. I wish I would have come when he was feeling better, he'd say even nicer things about him. <laughs> it's such beautiful things, and I, I appreciate it. And even though my name is Moshe, actually Chai Moshe, but my, most of my Rebbeim called me a Goylem or a Shaita, something like that. <laughs> but I really do appreciate Rav Kropkin's beautiful words, and and I, I'm so touched by the presence of such Choshev, a Choshev, a Ban I hear, some of whom I know, some I don't. And the beautiful Jews from Toronto, or I think you have to say Toronto, I, I just found that out. Is that, I don't know, I just found that out. Um, that I've come to meet and to fall in love with so quickly. And to come out on a rainy Masa Shabbos, such numbers. Because you mevakshe Hashem, because there's something that you want to connect in a deeper way to the Barikal Alam, to the creator of all worlds. Do you know that by the Chesidim, we tell stories, Matzah Shabbos, you know that. Especially, especially to tell them Aysif and the Baal It's a school of all good things that could be during the coming week, is to tell stories from the Baal Shem and from other tzaddikim. But just now, when I was listening to the Rav, I felt like beginning with a story that I wanted to share with you, because in a certain way I'm saying goodbye for the meantime, until we meet again. Hashem there Yerushalayim. There was a Mimer in Hasidus. I don't know what the Mimer is. I don't know which it is, but there's a story behind the Mimer that was said over by the great Tzaddik Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Dovber, the Rebbe Hashab from Lubavitch, Chusir Yelena. And this Maimer has a history that goes back to when his child, the Friedrich Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, was a little baby. So the Rebbe Hashab had a Chavusa, and they were learning Gemara, Shas and Poskim, he had a Chavusa. I don't know who the Chavusa was. You can imagine he must have been a great person. And that Chavusa was, was late at night. It was late at night during the week. And there was a freezing cold Russian night, and the Rebbe was learning with his Chavusa. And he told the Rebbitson that he would watch over the little baby Yosef Yitzchak. And she should go to sleep. And she would enjoy hearing the sound of the men learning, like many of our wives and mothers enjoy, while the, while the Rebbe would learn with the Chavus, and the little baby was sleeping in the crib with them together in the room. And they saw in a sefer that says that the Rebbe was learning with his Chavus, and little Yosef Yitzchak, the future Friedrich Rebbe, the future Lubavitcher Rebbe, was an extraordinarily beautiful child. They say people used to come to just to see him for a second. He was very, very beautiful. And during the time of their Chavusa, all of a sudden, the Rebbe Hashab heard that the little baby was making some little noises, scratching a little bit, and he was there, and he started to rock the crib. And he was looking at the baby, and then, he, and then he asked the Chavrusa to please leave. Now we're finished learning for the night. By the Bar Mitzvah, by that little baby's Bar Mitzvah, by Yosef Yisrael's Bar Mitzvah, his father, the Rebbe, presented him with a Maimur in Chassidus. Again, I don't know the exact name of the Maimur, what the Maimur is, but the Rebbe said to his son, when you were a little baby, I was learning at night, and your mother was sleeping in the next room. And I looked at you, and I was filled with such overwhelming love, I couldn't continue learning. I couldn't contain myself. So I asked my chavusa 
to leave, we were finished for the night. And I sat down and I poured my heart into my pen and I wrote that night this mimer. And I'm calling it for you, it's called a chassidish kiss. This is my chassidish kiss for my son. <coughs> and the shika chassidit, they would say nowadays, a chassidish kiss. Again, I don't know what that mimer is, I wish I did. I'm sure I could find out if I asked a Lubavitch, a friend of mine, to find out what it is. That he gave his son by the bar mitzvah. So I want to share with you a few words, and this is my chassid shakiz to, to my new friends here in Toronto. It's not the one that the Rebbe Yashab could give, it's just from a simple Jew, but to, but to my friends over here in Toronto, the Rabbanim, who I've met and who I don't know, I want to share with you something very, very important. I don't know how many of you know that something is happening right now in the world, and I'm not talking about in Iran. I'm not talking about in New York or in Toronto. I'm talking about everywhere in the world where a Jew lives, there's an aura that's coming into the world now. There's a light that's entering into the world, because now it's Mazda Shabbos, we finished Pashas Vayichi, and we're already learning Pashas Shmais, the Rabbis are already teaching us Pashas Shmais. And everybody knows that when we're entering into the world of Shmais, these weeks are called the weeks of what? Chavra. Shavra. Shmais, Ve'era, Boi Bishalach, Yisra, and Mishpatim. And a leap year, Trumatetzava. These are the weeks of Shavavim. The weeks where the Bas Kol can be heard by a sensitive ear that's calling out, Shuvu Banim Shavavim, my children who have been a little bit mischievous, I'm asking you to come back to me. Shuvu Banim Shavavim. And these weeks are called Shavavim, the weeks of Shavavim. For these parashiyas, Shmais and so on. Now truth be told, truth be told, I'm sure there are some people here who know all of Shas. And right now you're trying to remember where does it say any place in the Talmud Bavli, and if there's anybody here that knows the Yushalmi also, where does it say in the Yushalmi anything about these parashiyas of Shavavim as being anything special? The answer is, you want a fast thing on your computer? It was in Farak where there's a very big Talmud Chacham as a Bucky in all of Shas. And somebody said to him, you know, Rebbe, we don't really need you anymore, we have the computer. He said, you still need me on Shabbos. You still need me on Shabbos. In the <laughs> For Moshe Brown. No? You need me on Shabbos in Yantav. We need you every minute, Rabbi. All the, we need all the time we come and all the rebellion. A living, a lebedic, a tire. It doesn't say anywhere, Chavr, it doesn't say anywhere in the Gemara. Anything about Shavr. Nothing. Not in Torah Shabbat Shav, not in Torah Shabbat Peh. It doesn't say anything in the Medrash. Not Rabbah, not Medrash and Chuma. It doesn't say anything. Zohar Kodesh, the Tzaddikim pull out Ramazim. The emesis, Shoivim is something that was revealed later. Those who are connected to the Ariya Kodesh and the Kisvei Hari, Svadish Jews in particular, who drink that and the milk that they, that they nursed with know that there's something that's called Shavavim. There are already signs up all over Yerushalayim and other communities in Eretz well, and maybe even here someplace, in Borough Park and Williamsburg also a sign here or there, but Yerushalayim, every street corner, that there are different, tiniest tikkunim, right, that are taking place for Shavavim, gatherings of Jews to Davin, some fast. During these weeks, certain numbers of fasts, those who have that practice, special tefillahs that are said. And every year this is becoming stronger and stronger. Every year. We see as we get closer to Mashiach, there are certain Yom Tovim 
that even when I was a child, for instance, Tu B'Shvat. When I was a kid in yeshiva, Tu B'Shvat meant that there was a very short assembly. They gave us brown paper bags. Some of you might relate to this. We got these little brown paper bags. I sifted my way through the box of which were unedible <laughs> to try to get to a peanut or a raisin. I brought the boxer and the other stuff back to my parents. They ate that stuff. <laughs> they showed us like a, they, they sang some song about like Arza Alina or something. <laughs> something like that. And then they said, get back to class. And if you don't go back to class, you're getting thrown out. <laughs> that was Tuba Shvat, Tavshin Chafhei, 1965. Tuba Shvat. So Tuba Shvat. Tuba Av. Who heard of? Lag Boime, no. Lag Boime, you know, there were days he didn't say Tachnun, so everybody was happy, you know. He saved like 30 seconds in davening. But besides by Rabbi Shimon, and even now by Rabbi Shimon, it's not like it used to be. I went 45, 50 years ago to Rabbi Shimon, Lag Boime. There was a big island, but you can't compare to what's over there now. Tu b'shvat, tu b'av, lag b'ayim m'shoivavim, as we get closer to Mashiach, the or of these yom m'toivim, because these are Mashiach deke yom m'toivim, the or of these yom m'toivim becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, the light of these yom m'toivim. Because we're able to taste now a little bit of a preview of what's going to be when Mashiach comes. The simple pshat in the Indian of shoivavim, of these parashiyas of shmais, the simple pshat, is that when we went down into Garlis, we were in that Rishuz Sarabim, in that public domain of impurity that's called Erva Sa'aretz. Mitzrayim is a place of Tumah. Not just of Tumah, it's the world headquarters of impurity, is Mitzrayim. It's the epicenter of impurity. Erva Sa'aretz. And that over the course of these parashiyas, the nation that was trapped in the Memtes Shari Tuma, in Erva Sa'aretz, in the filth of Egypt, that, that nation was redeemed. And miraculously, we were transformed into a people who were able to cross through the Yamsuf and to receive the Tered Har Sinai and Heviani HaMelech Hadorov. The Baruch Shalom brought us into his royal chamber. And we had a Mishkan, we built a Mishkan for him. And the Bani Shalom said about us, that we were his Kal and we followed him into the Midbar. So the simple Pshat in these weeks is that these are parashiyas during which we can think about the pureness, the purity in our lives that we have lost. Some of the innocence that we've lost from the time that we were children. It's a time that we can daven for the innocence of our children. Hashem should guard their eyes and their ears. Our children are seeing things that you and I didn't see, maybe until many, many years later in life, and we're all suffering from the things that we've seen and we've heard. And our children are seeing these things and hearing them at a very early age, Hashem should watch over them. That they shouldn't have creases in their eyes and in their hearts. They should remain as they and pure. So on a simple level, we understand it's a time where we're trying to, we're trying to rejuvenate that tmimas, that innocence. And we're davening for our children, for ourselves. In a world that has become worse than Mitzrayim. The Rechaim HaKadosh talks about this in other tzaddikim, that the emesis that we're now in a place that's much deeper than the 49 levels of impurity. The difference is we have the Torah, Baruch Hashem. So we have a way to contend with impurity. Our ancestors didn't have yet the Torah. But we're in a place that's very, very far below 49. So we understand that these are weeks to daven, to think about that. Ask Hashem, please, Rabbi Yishalom, help me. I should be able to leave the Rishus Harabim of the street of the world. I should be able to climb into your arms in the Rishus Hayochid, Yochid, Echad, Yochid, Miyuchad, the creator of all worlds. I should be able to be in your arms. 
I was talking about that last night with the walls. I was talking about that last night. The chayma of our homes. The walls of our homes. We understand on a simple level that that's what Shavavim is about. Climbing out of Mitzrayim, moving into a Mishkan, it's beautiful. But we have to ask a question. It's a very simple question. All of us here, a number of months ago, we went through the time of Elul and Tishrei. Now, Shavim is a time of tshuva, of returning to Hashem. Of course, every day of our lives, every moment, is a time for tshuva. But the season, the oina, the tkufa, the time of tshuva is Elul and Tishrei. And all of us here spent hundreds, thousands of hours davening, fasting, working hard to do tshuva. So what is this sudden appearance of shavavim, of tshuva, a time of tshuva now? And how is this tshuva of shavavim different from the time of hashivenu Hashem Elechev and Hashuva of Elul and Tishrei. How is it different? So, Chavah, listen carefully. Because it's all that I was talking about over Shabbos. And it's really, it's what I'm always talking about. In life, there are two types of relationships. The two types of kshorim of relationships. The first we could call a relationship that's halacha based. We understand the Torah is very serious. Its laws are very exacting. Our chachamim revealed over the years, the centuries, Torah Shabal Peh. And you and I must do our best to live in accordance to every single sif cotton in the Mishnah Brewer, every single din in the Archa Shulchan and the Shulchan Acharav, in Tur and Shulchan Aruch. That's how we live with Jews. And there's a relationship that we have with Hashem Baruch that is one that's based upon legalities and particularities that Hashem Baruch has for His chosen people of how we're to conduct ourselves from moment to moment and from day to day. And we have to be very, very careful with Shabbos, with Yontiv, with every single drach and so on. And we have to spend every moment free that we have, that we're able to, learning these laws. And we said at Ha'asinai, Nasev, and Ishma, we makabal upon ourselves that we're going to try our best to keep these laws, these halachas, and all that's going to be revealed to us in the future. It's a beautiful and difficult world of mishpatim, of mitzvahs, of chukim. And we're all signed up to that program. We belong to that world, Ashrein. And in marriage, you also have responsibilities. There are Mishnais and Gemaras, Sugis and Ksubis and other places. There are responsibilities that are inscribed, that are written in the Ksuba. That a man has responsibilities, how to take care of his wife. And Achrayis. That the Torah demands that he learns what his responsibilities are. And there's a section of Evan Ezra and Shulchan Aruch, how to live as a Jewish husband and take care of a Jewish wife. 
And the wife has responsibilities as well. That are enumerated in the Mishnah. The Malachas, she is oisla baila. The responsibilities that the wife has to create a kosher and holy Jewish home. And to build those walls that we were talking about last night. Now something went, something went wrong by, the, by Har Sinai. Chazal described it in a terrible way. Aluva Kala. How embarrassing, how degrading it is. When there's a Kala who under her chuppah, she was unfaithful. And under the chuppah, we already turned our eyes to the eagle azov, to the golden calf. And by doing so, we violated the most essential rule of being a Jew. The beginning of the Asas Adibris. The very beginning, Aluva Kala. I don't want to say the rest of the Lashon of Chazal, it's too painful. Aluva Kala, how embarrassing it is for Kala. How embarrassing it is that we couldn't live up to Hashem's expectations of us, even by the chuppah. It's hard. It's hard to live as a Jew that observes every detail of halacha. And I fail very often and I'm sure that there are others here as well that struggle with this. And we try our best to make corrections and to do tshuva. Especially Elul and Tishrei. We sign up again and we coronate the king in Rosh Hashanah. And we say, Yechi HaMelech, Yechi HaMelech, Rabbi Yishalom, long live the king of all kings. We are your servants. Ono Avadecha. And we're going to try to be better servants this year. We're going to try to be more faithful servants and to keep Shulchan Aruch in a better way. And that's one part of Yiddishkeit and that's one part of marriage. The good husband takes care of his responsibilities, izun, nefarnes, to take care, to provide a parnosa for his wife, for the children, and all the other things that are enumerated in the ksuba and in halacha. And the wife tries to observe the halachas of what it means to be a Jewish wife, a Jewish woman. But there's another part to Yiddishkeit. Now the first part of Yiddishkeit that I just spoke about, which itself is very hard. But that part of Yiddishkeit all Orthodox Jews to one degree or another are on board. Some a little bit stronger, some a little bit weaker. But it's the life of an Orthodox Jew to observe halacha, to learn, to keep mitzvahs. And everybody here is committed to the program. I hate the initials that they use to describe people because Jews should never be, an, a human being should never be assigned any kind of Rosh Hashanah. But everybody knows that there's somebody that's called a BT. Don't raise your hands. But you really should be proud if you are a Baal Tshuva or Baal Tshuva, that's called a BT. You heard that expression? It's disgusting. Then there are those who are called FFBs. A couple of us here. That means, you know what? From, from birth. There's a friend of mine who said that he's an FFB WL. You ever hear that? That means from, from birth with lapses. So all of us are on that program, occasionally we mess up. BTs, FFBs, WL, 
We all believe in it and we observe it. But there's another part of Yiddishkeit, which is hard for me to talk about. That's what I mean by the Hasidic kids. And for many, many years, I'm looking for this. And the little, little crumbs that I'm able to gather, I try to share with other Jews. There's a Yiddish kait of Shira Shira. Do I have to explain that? There's a Yiddish kait of Shira Shira. You know, according to Allah, I was in Chicago, I spoke to the Jews, Elul, about this a little bit. You know, according to Allah, if you learn Masech the Kedushin, you know that you could appoint a Shliach to be Makadish a wife, correct? You could send a Shliach to betroth a wife for yourself. You could send a Shliach. You can send a messenger. And according to Allah, you're 1,000%. She's 1,000% Mikudashas. Comes with a ring. Fulfills his shlichas. Mikudashas. What happens if the husband lives in New York? The Makadesh lives in New York. And the Kala lives in Los Angeles. And she said, I'd like to now come to you, that we should be able to complete the marriage and so on, and have a life together. And he said, no, 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 I'm satisfied with this kind of a relationship. I sent a shliach and you're mekudashes. I think everybody here would agree that that's not a shidduch you would want for your daughter. Nahan? I think everybody here would agree that that person should, should be taught what it means to be a Jewish husband. That you can't send a shliach, you might be able to send a shliach, and you're halachically betrothed. But you haven't even entered into the world of Shir Hashir. The world of Shir Hashim is something else altogether. There the chasen gives the kala a ring under the chuppah. Rabbi Leib Leiger, you know who Rabbi Leib Leiger was? Rabbi Leib Leiger's father was who? Rabbi Shloim Leiger. Rabbi Shloim Leiger's father was who? You have to close your eyes and hold your breath. Who was Rabbi Shloim Leiger's father? Rabbi Kiva Eiger. He went a little bit away from the rest of the family. Rebbe said that the custom of the Jewish people is to give a ring. The different custom is what type of a ring. But that circle of the ring is the letter Samach. And Samach is the letter of Samach Hashem L'chol The word Samach means to support, to hold up. Because the Chosn is saying to his Kala, For the rest of my life, I'll do everything I can to be here for you, to hold you up. The breaking of the glass by the chuppah, of course, is to remember you shall I. Sadiqim say that it also means that there are going to be times in life where there's going to be in our lives things that are broken. Things happen in life, and there are, there's going to be shattered glass. Things break in life. But I promise you, no matter what, this Kesha that we have is not going to break. That we're going to do the best we can possibly do to see to it. That even though the world might be breaking around us, that this Kesher between us is not going to break. It's going to be whole. Because Shira Shira means that when two people get married, it's not just about halachic responsibilities. There's a Jew that I remember when I was, a, when I was learning in Yeshiva in Eretz and he was showing off to me, he said that Rosh Hashanah had been to 12 different kehilas to hear the shayfa. And I asked him, why did you go to 12 different shuls? 
He said because he wanted to be yaitze all the different shaitas. So he wanted to hear the, how the Taimanim blow the shoifer, and different chassidim blow the shoifer, and different uh, uh, German Jews blow the shoifer, that he should make sure this way he'd be yaitze tkir shoifer. So of course he needs therapy, uh, that's obvious. <laughs> Such a person needs some serious therapy. I guess nowadays they call that OCD, and there are other terms that come along, other reshetavis, not be tiered, other reshetavis that go for such a person. But I asked him, tell me something, in all of the trips that you made up and down the streets of Yerushalayim, did you have a chance to think once for a second, HaMelech, that there's a king? Now, I wasn't telling him to be lenient with the laws of Tkir Shaifa. I also listened to the Shaifa. I just go to one place, I listen to it, in Eish and I'm happy with the Baltakaya. He happens to be a Sephardi, and I love the way he blows Shaifa. Because the Baruch Shalom, in his relationship with us, wasn't only talking about responsibilities. He wasn't only talking about halacha. He was talking about the ring, the tabaz. He was talking about the wedding ring. There's an old song, I mentioned this last year, when I was with the Chevron in Florida, there's an old song from the 1960s, forgive me, I know the Choshe Rabbanim here, forgive me for quoting a song that I remember, an English song, a non-Jewish song, from the 1960s, I don't remember who sang it. It's not necessary to remember who sang it and not to remember the song either, but what can I do? I'm, I remember it and I'm telling it to you. But there was a line in the song that said, this diamond ring doesn't shine for me anymore. This diamond ring doesn't mean what it meant before. How many husbands and wives I talk to, where they're 100% halachically married. Not only they're halachically married, he does carpool, he earns a beautiful living. Like I mentioned last night, he does the light bulbs. He takes care of his responsibilities. So why is it that so many of these couples end up in my office? And I'm going to describe to you now the way it goes around 92, 93% of the time. I get a call from somebody, from a woman, she'd like to come with her husband to see me. They come to the office. How are you? Rivka, Yitzchak, everything okay? She already is starting to wipe her eyes. I move the tissue box. I always keep a tissue box on the table. I move the box gently closer to her. And at this point, I'll always ask, the Zacher, that means the people on this side of the room, I always ask the Zacher, why are you here? A significant percentage of the time, the Zacher will point to the Nekeva, <laughs> that means you, and will say, I don't know, Rivka wanted us to come. So now she's already on her third or fourth tissue. And I say, look, Yitzchak, Rivka's crying. Why are you here? And then he'll say something like this. This is not about any of the chavah that are here, but just theoretically, listen to me. He'll say something like, I don't know what's bothering her. Do I not provide you with a beautiful home? Do, I, do you not have a comfortable home? You don't have to go to work. I take care of everything. Am I not a good father? I don't love the children. I, then he'll say stuff like, I don't do carpool, I, didn't, I don't remember our anniversary most of the time, things like that. And now it's like a next box of tissues. <laughs> Sorry for being hard on the guys, but it's not of anybody here, just theoretically. So then I say, Rivka, why are you here? And she'll say something like, Rebbe, do you understand how heartbroken I am? I say, tell me how heartbroken you are. And now, if you look at Yitzchak, which I always do at this point, Yitzchak is looking at my svarim. <laughs> I didn't know there was a new edition of the Shai Gisai that came out. Really? The Sefer Mrs. the Rapsadia going, they put out now seven volumes. <laughs> Stuff like that. 
I say, Yitzhak, what's the story, Yitzhak? Your wife is upset. So if she was from the 60s and she knew the song, she would start to sing, this diamond ring doesn't shine for me anymore. And this diamond ring doesn't mean what it meant before. Because when we stood under the chuppah, even though, of course, we accepted the responsibility in halacha to be together and to take care of each other according to halacha, exactly what the Shulchan Aruch tells us, that we're going to be halachic Jews 100%. No compromises. But I was hoping and I really believed that the way that we looked at each other when you put the ring on my finger, I really, really believed that we were going to have a life that was going to be shir shirim dik. I really believed there was going to be something more, something deeper. And I miss you. And I don't know how to get that back. I've tried so hard to get that back. I don't know how. So the master of all worlds says to his Navi Yirmiya, Pan I if you have turned your backs to me. And the Alter Rebbe Shusinglin says that there are two right, there are two types of relationships. We know from Chazal there's a relationship that's called Panim El Panim, face to face, and there's a relationship that's called Achor Bachor, back to back. And you can live in the same house together for 40, 50 years. And you can be good people who are good to each other, but you're not facing each other anymore. You know what it is just nowadays to be able to look at a Jew in the eyes? Try looking at, at, a, at a teenager in the eyes these days. Go into a class of teenagers and try to look at them in the eyes if they have their phones with them. Just talking to people these days and being able to connect to somebody for more than 10 seconds without dragging them around and looking at something else. The Baruch Shalom loves a world of panam al panam. Panam al panam. Rivka is looking for panam al panam. She believed that she was going to have that in a relationship with Yitzchak. And it hasn't turned out that way. And the master of all the worlds, the one who created us, created us to have two levels of relationship with him. And I know this conversation makes many, many rabbinic Jews nervous and uncomfortable. And I don't care. Because it's the truth of Tyre. And you could spend your whole life making believe that the Bani Shalom has nothing in his world except hearing the cipher in 12 different places. And you can go around your whole life quoting all kinds of Mara Mekaymas. And you don't know that the Shekhinah herself is crying and saying, I miss that person that I created because I wanted to have a relationship with you, that when you would daven, you would look at me with your eyes. That when you would be learning with me, you would be remembering who I am. I asked a group of Jews last summer whose sons were learning in the finest yeshivas in New York, the finest top yeshivas in New York. I asked them to do some homework. I said, go home and ask your boys. Most chosh of yeshivas, I don't want to name the yeshivas, the Ivy League yeshivas. Ask your boys, when was the last time they ever thought of God? Don't say to Rabbi Shalom, say God. Ask them when was the last time during learning, when was the last time they ever thought there was a Rabbi Shalom? I said, just homework. Because I would see the guys on Shabbos, and then they come back the next Shabbos. That's in the Catskills. So they came back, and I asked Nuchavit, did you do the homework? I did the homework. The Chavit told me that their sons, they were talking to their sons, and their sons, every single one of them said to them the truth, Abba, Tati, Daddy, not even once. Never in my learning have I ever thought about the Kaddish Baruch. One of them said that my son said that he felt bad and he thought about that sometimes. And I knew who the boy was because I could tell when he would come how he davened. You could tell by how he davened. Davening is when this stuff comes out. Davening is when it comes out. The people who are not connecting to Hashem, who don't have that panam al panam, davening is an uncomfortable time. That means it's kiddush clubs, talking, coming late, leaving early. Fashtaytzach, right? You understand what that means. It's uncomfortable davening. 
It's uncomfortable. Learning is not uncomfortable. You could see people that, have, that can't daven for more than five, ten minutes, but they could sit and learn for five, ten hours. Jews are smart, they enjoy learning. The halachic part, all those things, those are okay. Davening is funny. Because davening is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be chuppah, something. Davening is different. So I know I'm being, I'm being too long and I apologize. Please be moichel me. What hurts? What hurts more? Let's talk about the couple. And then I'm going to explain how all this works out with Shavuot. What hurts more? If a husband, I'm using this, I'm just using the same marshal, sometimes it's all reversed. So forgive me, I'm just using the more common model. What hurts more? When a husband is not fulfilling which means, what it says in the Ksuba, that I'm going to provide food and panasa for my wife. So let's say this husband has tried year after year to have a good panasa. He's a great guy. Great guy. Tries hard. He's gotten bad breaks. It hasn't worked out. He doesn't make much of a panasa. And they've been struggling. They're still living maybe in a small apartment. They're not able to go out to eat. It's been hard. But he's a good guy. But he's not fulfilling the halachic responsibility. That's in the ksuba. Then you have another guy that he's tap of the line, panasa, tap of the line. The only problem with him is that his wife has found things on his smartphone. Do I, have to, I don't have to explain what that means, right? I'm not talking about business, other things on the smartphone. The first wife, whose husband does not provide much of a panasa, who's not 100% halachically there as a husband, but he adores her, and he does what he's able to do in that world of a relationship of panam al-panam. I have never had a situation where a wife says to me, Rabbi, I am demanding that you extract a get from my husband because I am not satisfied with the house that he has built for me. I've never seen that. I have never seen a woman who has said, I want to get because he has not fulfilled Izun Vafanis. He has not provided a panasa the way that I was expecting. I've never had a get like that. Maybe some of the rabbanim here have had that. I've never had a get like that with anybody. But I'm dealing with gitten, unfortunately, all the time. They're never about that. They're always about the other stuff. Shira, shira. Because that hurts more. Because that reaches into the very core of the relationship, the essence of the relationship. It means it's oyster relationship. So let's talk now about Shavim for the next five minutes, and I'll tell you a story. We'll sing a niggin, and we'll go home. Shavim. Shavim is not written in Tereshabach Sav and Tereshabach Peh. You know why? One of my daughters went out on a date with a guy. I mean, my girls are already kind of her with their own families, but years ago she went out with the guy. And they went, as many Jews go when they're dating, they went out to some hotel lobby. The guy gets her a soda, whatever, they're sitting there. And like every 15 minutes or so, this guy has to go to the Beis HaKisei. So she figured he's not feeling too well. You know, He's going out to the, to the men's room every, every couple of minutes. 
how this came about, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it should not have been a discussion, but in her conversation with a friend of hers who went out with a guy, turns out that he was also frequenting the Beis Akisa. It wasn't just like a bad night. Was, he goes a lot to the men's room. Now, the reason it turns out that he was going to the men's room, how, we, how they found out the girls, I'm not going into. Maybe they shouldn't have. It turns out that he was going there to call mom to ask for some new things he could say. What do you think about that, girls? In other words, he was running out of material, and I guess he couldn't find his crib sheets or something. I don't know what. But the guy was going to the, he said, hey, you'll excuse me. He goes out to the base at Kisa, comes back and says, uh, so uh, any brothers or sisters? <laughs> ah, it's nice, nice, nice. Seminary was nice, you enjoyed it, good, good. Excuse me, I have to go to the men's room for a minute. <laughs> You know, there are certain things that if you have to get a note, if you have to get a letter, if it has to be written, does somebody have to tell you that you hide me the rice and to kiss your kid? It says in this week's parasha that we just learned Shabbos by Yankiv Avinu. It says in Pesach, He was kissing them. He was hugging them. Sverna says, because the only way you could bring the brach, the only way Yankiv Avinu could bring the brach into their lives was through a hug and through a kiss. That's what I mean by chesidish a kiss. Do you understand what I'm saying? Shavim can't be written. It's not part of, even in Shir Hashim it couldn't be written because it's for the Jews of the end of time who still care about having a relationship. It's after being married to God for thousands of years and we're losing that, which was natural in the relationship for so many years, we're losing it now. And we're more from than our parents and grandparents. We have bigger chumras. My father always likes to say, every Seder, he likes to say something like this. I mean, I'm translating it into the English. He, would, he says like this. I sat by the Seder of the Minchas Aluza. You ever hear the Minchas Aluza? He was a big time of you know that. And he didn't eat a matzah like that, a piece of matzah. <laughs> when I was in high school, I brought the card, you know, with the, with the measure on it. My father says, what are you doing? And I said, because I have to have a kiz, I have to have a kizai, so two kizai. And they gave us in school these laminated cards that's maybe it wasn't laminated back then, but they gave us these cards that says the measure for kizai. So my father said, get that out of here. Here's a kizai. And I said, Dad, that's not a kizai. My card says a kizai. My father says, I was by the Minchas he didn't have uh, he didn't have a cardboard like that with such a kizai to have the table. He didn't have such a kizai. Here's your piece of matzah. He didn't make a brook and he didn't fight. <laughs> like we've lost our natural swing, you know, we've lost that. And we're much more machmer than our parents and grandparents. Much stricter in halacha. Ah. Oh, we have so many svarim and so many books. English and every language. And we're more careful with the contracts and the laws which is beautiful. I'm not saying that's not good. And I still said to my father, well, the matzahs were much thicker by the Michal Zalaz, right? Because so. <laughs> now the matzahs are so thin, they're much thicker. That's my father said, ah, <coughs> I don't think it was so thick. But, uh, no. There are certain things that if you have to go to the men's room to read it in a book or something, it already is showing this git, you understand? It's already not good. There's something that's unspoken. There's something that doesn't have words. That's what I'm trying to say by Chesidish Kiss. Shavavim is not a time of Elul and Tishrei. Elul Tishrei is essentially the tshuva of Ashivei Hashem Elechav Neshuva for the things that we have violated and we've done wrong, and we have to fix. Meachus, we have to fix. Shoyvim comes from the world of the Ariya Kodesh. It comes from the world of the Chachme Hapnimius, of that hidden world of the Zoya, the Tikkun Zoya, of something, of the world of Tzvas, of Rabbi Shimon. It comes from a different world. It's the same world, but it's deeper.
Shoivim comes from such a place where a Jew who's attentive is able to hear the Baruch Shalom say, cry out, Shuvu Eli, come back to me. And I'm not talking just about that Sif Katna in the Mishnah Bura. I know that you're trying to keep everything in the Shulchan Aruch, but I want to have a relationship with you. Shuvu Eli, return to me. I miss you. I miss what it was like under the Chuppah. I want to be connected to you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to, I want you to look at the ring, to take it out of the drawer and, and to blow the dust off of that ring. I want to have a connection to you. The Baruch Shalom wants that from us. Therefore, there's this different time. It's called Shavuot. Return to me. Shuvu Eli. The Mishkan. Heviyani HaMelech Chadarov. Nagila V'Nismech HaBach. Ma'amish. Chador of the king's royal chamber, his room, all of Shir Shir. So I'm going to end, I'll tell you a story. And then I'm going to play you a song. I'm doing this because a couple of Bachim asked me last night if I could play this. And I, I said, oh, I didn't, I said, I'll think about it. And I thought about it, and okay, I'll play it. I'm not going to sing it, I'll play it for you. But I'll tell you first, Amaisa. I thought many of you probably have heard this story, maybe from me or from somebody else. There were these two tzaddikim that were the dearest friends. Rabbi Avram from Trisk and Vermendel of Orca. And they were dearest, closest friends, like brothers, from when they were children, they grew up in such a way. And now they were already older and time had come for them to each go to his own place to get married and so on, to move ahead with life. But they made a bris with each other, they made a, an agreement with each other, a covenant. At that time, at the beginning, they were living with a forest that separated between the two of them. A deep, dark forest between them. And they were in villages on both sides. And they decided that they would send each other every single Erev Shabbos a letter. So Remendel of Orca found a Jew over there in his village who was in awe of him, of the tzaddik, and he agreed that he would be the mailman. They would deliver the letter from Remendel of Orca to Rabbi Avram Latriska. That means that Erev Shabbos, he would have to not go to work and cross over this forest to walk through this forest, which was a mahalach, in bad weather, all kinds of things, to get through the forest and to bring the, the letter over. And then he would wait there, and the Triskamag would go into a room for a while and would come out with an envelope and say, Good Shabbos, good Shabbos, Yankala, take this to my friend Remendelin. And he was the most envied Jew in town, you can imagine. He was the one that was bringing the letter back and forth, the letters. And he did this for quite some time. Now finally it happened one day that he had a big Yetz Sahara, And he did something that's not allowed. And he justified it by saying, you know, I want to see what Sadiqim write to each other, you know. So he went into the forest in the beginning and he got this letter from Mendel Vorka and he opened up the envelope and he looked at the page and it was blank. It was a blank piece of paper. And he couldn't believe it. This is some sort of a horrible joke. This is what I'm spending my Erev Shabbos, taking a piece of paper, there's nothing on it. He was very hurt. He didn't know what to do, but he went on to Triska Magid, and he gave him the letter. Triska Magid stays there in the room for a while, comes out with an envelope, gives it to him, says, good Shabbos. He goes, into the, he goes out of the house, but he doesn't wait till he gets to the forest. He right away looks at the paper, it's also blank. He says, either they're both crazy or they're both terrible people. I, I don't know what kind of a thing this is. What is this kind of thing? This is what I'm doing for five years, and carrying pieces of paper. He comes back to a medal of worker. A medal is waiting. He says, ah, ah, your uncle, shkoyach, shkoyach. What, did you bring me something? He said, yeah, I have. Yeah, here's a letter. And the Rebbe saw right away that your uncle is in a bad mood. The whole Shabbos, your uncle doesn't come to Davin over there by the, by the Bismedrash. After Shabbos, the Rebbe calls for your uncle. He says, no, no, what's the matter, your uncle? You didn't come to Davin today. What's wrong? He said, Rabbi, really? 
I'll tell you, Rabbi, what's wrong. I'm very hurt. I did an Avera. Hashem should forgive me, and I hope the Rebbe forgives me. And the Rebbe looks, no, what happened? What happened is I opened up the envelope that the Rebbe sent to Tisker Market. I opened it up, and the Rebbe said, no. And what did you see? He says, Rebbe, you know what I saw? I saw nothing. It was an empty letter. <coughs> and not only that, Rebbe, I went to your friend, the other one over there, and I got from him a letter, which I brought to you. And guess what? I didn't even wait to get to the forest to read that one. And that's also empty, as you know, Rabbi. It's an empty letter. So I don't understand what kind of cruel game this is that you're playing with me. So Mendel Vorka said to him, listen, Yanko, chas It's not a game. You know, the Torah is written with black letters upon a white parchment. 99% of the time, or maybe 90% of the time, whatever, we send each other letters with black ink. But sometimes when we miss each other so badly, we just send the white parchment. Because the parchment, that Sadiqim say, the Swarm tells that the parchment is much, much deeper than the letters. It's that which can't be told. It's that which can't be written. That's the parchment, the white parchment. So, Hever, Jews of Toronto, friends, all I could do together with you is to part with a chesed kiss and, and to give you a bracha and myself a bracha and all of our relationships, husbands and wives, and children, parents, brothers and sisters, friends, teachers and students. That we should be zayichim et Hashem to send from Mendel Vorka and Triska Magid's letters to each other also. There are a lot of black... There's a lot of black ink, text messages, WhatsApps, emails. But we're losing the white parchment. So I want to give you a bracha to find that. And I, I played this niggin last year when I, was in, when I was there in Boca with the Hever there. And I know this is unconventional. And I hope my wife set this up for me. I hope it's going to work out. So I'm going to play this niggin for you. Some of you might know it. In our shul, there's a, our shul Eish Kodesh, we had, we had an album, actually my son was the one that really worked on it to put this together with some of the most talented Jewish musicians in the world, who I'm very close to, Eitan Katz, Shlomo Katz, Yosef Karduna, Raz Harman, others that I'm very close to, I want to see all the names, Chaim David, Chavra, of musicians. And an album was put together with the music of a very mysterious musician, a composer who's not well known, because he never has allowed for his tapes to be sold publicly. His name is Michael Shapiro, Michael Shapiro. I'm not going to go into that story. That's an interesting story. It's not for now. And he has a number of albums that, and there's a secret society of Jews that listen to his music. I've been listening for, and haven't stopped listening for over 30 years. And we asked him if he was okay with us having some of his songs redone with our chevra. And it was done last year in Yerushalayim. And there's an igan that I've been playing around the world. You can get it. You can get the album. There's an igan that I've been playing. And I hope this works with the microphone. I pl and I want you to hear it. Because it's everything that I'm talking about and I always talk about. And I want to share this with you by way of the chesed shakiz. The one who's singing it is a very, very dear friend of mine. His name is Davidal, Reb Davidal Weinberg. Some of you here, I think, know him. He's a teacher of Torah in Yerushalayim. He's the Rav Shleim Bez Hashem. He's a very special person. And here's the niggin. Here? Closer? 